Welcome to part two with actor Vernon Wells. Sitting in the stars and watching you. You got a ride to go with the moon. Vernon is going to talk right now about the Wolf Sanctuary for the Wolves. Yes. And I'd like you to share the website where people can donate. Um, it's Apex, um, and if you go on to Apex, you will go into the website for our wolves and wolf dogs. We actually started off, I, I met Steve and Paula way back um, when I was working for Wolf Connection. I was uh, going out, uh, my wife and I, we'd go out every weekend and walk the, the wolves and wolf pups. And uh, talking to Steve and Paula, who were associates, and um, through circumstance, another person that had been up there walking with the wolves was telling them about it and said, you know, you should do it because you guys love animals. And I said, yeah, come up and I'll get you a couple of good wolves. And I went, well, how do you do that? I said, I work there, you dumbass, come up. So they came up and never left. And they were there for like three or four years working. And then they branched off and opened their own um, wolf, a wolf uh, rescue, Apex. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started off with six. Then we said we only ever have eight. Now we've got 27. It just grows and grows and we rescue throughout America, not just here, but um, we've rescued probably 300 wolves from breeders. Um, we did a big one about four years, five years ago. Huge rescue, 120 um, wolves and, and um, hybrids that were in a backyard. And, um, and the people, that had, the old couple that were doing it had passed away. And, uh, and all the wolves, of course, they weren't getting fed, so they started howling. So the neighbours decided they'd throw poison meat over to shut them up. So it became this race because we got notified, or Steve got notified, and they put together a whole group, and um, they went up and talked to the police. The police said, we're going to go and shoot them all. <gasps> no. um, and uh, Steve said, well, how long can we have? And they said, don't have anything. So they went to court, basically, and got a one-month stay. They had 30 days, but they couldn't take any of the wolves anywhere unless they were neutered, spaded, and had all their injections. So they had two vets on staff with us, doing everything, 24 hours a day. They had a group catching the wolves in this, and most of them were near impossible to catch because they'd get under the house, they'd dunk tunnels everywhere. It was like a nightmare. But eventually they got all of them, they caught them all, they were all um, neutered and, and spayed and had their injections and they went out to different shelters and there was four left. And there were these really old, bitchy wolves who would not come near, they'd rather bite your arm off, they were just, you know, come near me, I'll eat you alive. They're very huge, aren't they? Yes, and so Steve said to the police chief, he came to have a look at the end of the month, and Steve said, look, I'm sorry, we've tried and we just can't get these four and it just breaks my heart to have to tell you that just can we leave before you do it? And the guy went, do what? To before you shoot them. Why would you shoot them? But you guys have got all the time you need to find them. Go do the job. So because of what they did in the time they had, these people were stunned at what they'd achieved and they were in no way were they going to go and kill these wolves that they tried so hard to save? So we got them all out. That's awesome. And they went every year, and two of them turned up at, at um, our place down here. But um, up there, we have, uh, up at the sanctuary up on uh, the 14th. Mm -hmm. In Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, yeah. It's up in the high desert. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we have some of the most beautiful, beautiful animals. And it, it, I just love 
saying to people that you have no idea what a wolf is till you go and spend a day with a real one. I don't understand what a wolf is. A wolf is not a canine that tracks you, wants to kill you. A wolf is a canine that does not like humans. They want to be in the next 3,000 mile away to get away from you. They do not like us because they know through generation after generation, we kill them for no good reason. So they don't want to be around us. They want to be as far away from us as they can be. But once you get past that and you have them in a, um, a situation where they're being cared for every day, every weekend, people come and go out on wolf walks, you know, with six or seven of the wolves running free, by the way. Mm -hmm. And we have little kids, six years old, hanging around their, their, their necks, cuddling them. And the wolves have great smiles. They're like, Beautiful. because just like big dogs in reality. Um, but they were the big dogs that started the big dogs we had. Right. But, goes, but please, please give the audience a warning about trying because they're all so cute when they're little please tell them the no, dangers no. they are actually putting that species in when they decide to adopt a wolf pup and then drop it off at a shelter yeah the problem is with um, wolves and wolf pups when you decide you're going to go and buy one because they're cute and they're that big and they're all fluffy and they're licky <laughs> They're just wonderful. Well, within seven months, they're cute and probably two and a half feet at the top of their head standing beside you and all teeth. Um, and if you, they're very pack oriented. They need to be with people or other animals. They're just, that's where they are. So if you just leave them at home and they can't get anywhere, they will demolish your house. It's just everything in it. Um, we, we tried it one day just for fun. We put a, a brand new sofa in a, one of the runs with two wolves and it took them 23 hours to demolish it into little tiny pieces. <laughs> they, they can, you have no idea. These animals can do it big. Um, they make a Labrador look like a dream. <laughs> oh, yes. And then, see, the other side of that is that Eddie, our dog, who is, what, 11 pounds? He tells them what to do. Really? Is he tells is them the, what uh, to do. Is the pack he will, <laughs> yeah, he will stand in front of them and just look at them and they'll go, we will just go back outside. <laughs> they just will turn around and walk out because he he's so little too, isn't it funny? Well, he grew up with the big red, uh, the big black, the, the original um, pack leader when, um, when she was alive. Oh. And Ed was... Three months old, she was, I think, nine months old. I could have the dates wrong, but she was older than him. But they grew up together. But once she became pack leader, it all changed because now she had a responsibility of the wolves. And unfortunately, the rest of the pack went, do we eat him or what? You know, so couldn't that leave Eddie with him? It <laughs> wasn't the idea because Eddie would never bow down and go, She's the boss, I'm not. He was always, I the boss, she does what I say, and they just, you know, <laughs> you um, so He's such a placid dog, he's lovely. I've got a picture of him. Yeah, he's just, he's just a, like a, a total little person. He has he's his own. my dog, he's 90 pounds. Well, yeah. you got a... Pitbull, boxer. Good. 90 pounds? Yeah, he's, he's on a diet right now. The vet's put him on a diet. I cook God. him chicken and rice and he has steak. <laughs> well, I, I read an article yesterday, uh, someone said it to me, was if the Game of Thrones, the wolf in the last two, in the last season, the huge wolf, they had the dire wolf, which was her wolf and he was was actually the guy that was a star, his wolf, that he thought had been killed. Um, and it was all the way through to the end. Um, that wolf was a real wolf dog. And it grew to be two, three foot six. Yeah, three foot six at the top of his head standing beside you. Oh, wow. We did that with Grace. Grace is five foot one. 
and it came up to her chest, this animal. <gasps> and it was huge and the most gentle, lovable animal. The guy that owned it said it was useless, he didn't want it, so he took it to a kill show. Somebody just happened to be in the kill shelter at the time looking for something else. I'm not sure what they were looking for. And they saw it and they went, what the? And they went over and sat with it and it just laid its head in her lap and sat with her with this look of, what did I do? You know, oh, why, is why are people so bloody cruel? Yeah, so she took him home and he lived another... God, how long ago was Game of Thrones? Eight years ago or yeah. something? He lived up until uh, this year. Oh. And he passed away gently as all oh, large, and large. Happy, hopefully. Oh, yeah. He, he was in a beautiful home with three or four other dogs, and he was as happy as a clam. Oh. Just, people don't understand them, and they don't want to. They just, you know, it's this whole thing of they, they will kill your babies, they'll eat all your sheep, they'll kill all your cattle. It's like um, eagles kill more lambs than wolves. Right. But you can't convince people of that. They don't want to know. They just... So, um, and we have them up there. And if you ever want to go up, you just have to go onto the website, mm -hmm. Apex Protection Society. Go onto the website, go in, have a look at everything. It lists all of the wolves. You'll see them. Um, everybody that's there, and then you can um, make arrangements to be the normally. If there's only two of you, they'll probably try to get you in with another group because they usually like to take out a, a minimum of eight people. Otherwise, it becomes not worth it. You know, it's kind of you're taking two people out with the dogs. I mean, the dogs everywhere for not a really good reason. If you've got eight people, everybody has a lot of fun. So do the wolves running through you like a, a, a small mini tank. Right. Um, what an amazing but, experience, though. People uh, should go up there I, and donate. Yeah. I, um, it does cost, by the way, to do it. Um, okay. I, no, I was just saying for the people that are watching this, it does cost uh, to do it because you get, you get to meet the wolves, you get to go on the wolf walk, you get to have dinner, which is prepared, you get to have the wolves serenade you. You get to have Steve possibly do magic for you. He's one of the best magicians in California. And um, he will usually, what he does is he'll start the wolves howling and sing with them and they sing. It's, it's just amazing to listen. I was, I was talking to someone that was a skeptic who was there. And I said, how are you feeling? And uh, Said if I could stop crying, I'd be fine. Oh, my heart! It um, they get to you in a in a way that nothing else will, and I think that's why we consider them a threat because they know us so well, and they're just. But they are part of who we are. They they started life with us, and now we treat them like they don't exist. And there's actually a, a very nice thing that I have, which says, "What happened?" I always remember when we found the food they needed and helped them kill it. Mm. Now, we go near the food that we need and they kill us. What happened? It's just that way it is. We just remember. But anyway, well, that's in what... Well, in reality, Vernon, unless there's something wrong with the animal, rabies or stuff, animals don't kill each other unless it's no. for food. Right? Yep. And they won't but, kill... But people do kill each other. Oh. But, for no yeah. reason whatsoever. Yeah, for joy. No, animals... And they won't kill animals that are strong because they, they like the herd to always be strong because that's their life. That's how they stay to live. That's where they get food if they need it. However, if, if there's a sick one, one with a broken leg, they will kill them and they will eat them because that's what they're there for, to make sure that everything is, is done well, is fine, is good. And they do it well, and that's the problem. If they butcher it occasionally, they don't mind like liking more. But they're too good at what they do. They keep the herds really, really good. All the animals in it really, really top end. And um, but so they get blamed for killing all the, the sheep and cattle when they don't. 
Right. You know, so anyway, it's a it's it's a thing, and you can go on for days talking about it. And everybody has their own opinion. And take my word for it. I'm not trying to tell anybody they're wrong and I'm right. What I'm saying is that if you go see them, you change your mind. Uh, it's a much simpler thing than trying to preach to people that these animals. I had a friend of mine come up to me uh, Monday night. We had we're having a little sundown up here um, down by the house, and. Um, Someone said, oh, you went over to see the wolves. With me. Well, How was it? And he went, uh, I'm a believer. <laughs> totally was the last human being I ever thought would go to see the wolves. Really? Believe it. Didn't believe it. They're just bloody big dogs and they should all be got rid of them. Now, he just, he raved for like 25 minutes on how amazing they are. And what an amazing thing it is to be amongst them and have them there with you. These animals that, if they ever wanted to, could bring you down and rip you into small pieces. And yet they have no ill feeling. They just run with you. They come running back. They get a cuddle. They run off. You know, they're just like any other um, creature. You know, they love that interaction. But, right. But, uh, yeah, so do it. It's worthwhile. Okay. And, and the importance of donating. Oh let's, yes. Let's share that because it it, it is expensive. important that people get donations because it's expensive to just uh, feed and uh, food and shelter. Can you just explain? When that we to me? Um, yeah, when we saved the hundred and twenty dogs, that cost just over a quarter of a million dollars, which we had to raise in a month. And we're very fortunate that so many people, when they saw what we were doing, were like, oh, my God, and they all came in to, to give donations, which helped immensely. But it is not cheap. We have a bill of probably $75,000 a year in vets. Because if these dogs sneeze, they take them to the vet. They are so well looked after. There is not one thing that they're not treated for. If they've got it, they're amazing looking, and they take all different kinds of dogs, um, and wolf dogs and wolves. Right. Some of them have got a lot of problems, and they work through them, and they, they change them. I mean, it's, Steve is amazing. Steve is a wolf. I mean, he gets down there with them, and he, they'll, they'll all be fighting, and he just gets in the middle of them and starts pulling them out and telling them to knock it off, and they all, they all cringe. They go, hey, the boss is here. <laughs> he's the he, alpha. He, yes, he's yeah. basically, with them, he's the alpha. They accept it. They don't chastise. They don't try to take it off him. They go, you boss. And it's, it's interesting to watch. But, yeah. Anyway, I could talk to them for weeks. Um, I know you love those wolves. And I can't yeah. wait to meet them. I'm so excited. I? I can't wait to come up there and meet them. I did work with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger in Commando. Yeah. Do you remember that story, that one? <laughs> Arnie was um, interesting. He's, he's small, he's, you know. He what? He's, he's, he's not as tall as they portray on. Because you're no. taller than him, a lot taller no. than him. He's actually a little shorter, but anyway. Yeah. But um, he, uh, he, I, I got asked to go out and audition for that film when I was here in America. I'd been brought over when I first came over to do um, Weird Science. And, um, and playing the same role as I played in Road Warrior, but with a few you know, different things, so it didn't look like I was Wes. How it couldn't look like I was Wes, I'll never know. But um, <laughs> So um, I was doing that, and while I was doing that, the, uh, the producer, Joel Silver, said, my next movie is with um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I had no idea who Arnold Schwarzenegger was. I think only people that lived here did. Yeah. Because it wasn't a big deal where I came from, you know, Mr. Who. It, yeah. Um, so I said, uh, okay. And he said, and, uh, I'd like you to come and talk to the director about playing the, the villain. And I went, okay. And I said, can you do me a favor? And he said, yeah. I said, who is Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> <laughs> he went, Mr. Mr. America, Mr. World, you know, this whole big thing. And I said, Mr. World, what? He said, buddy building. Ah, no idea. 
So I went to see the director and then he said, no, I've got someone else and uh, to play the role and he would just wes it up and destroy everything I'm trying to achieve. I thought, I right, cool. I go and home now. So I virtually left and got on a plane and flew back to Australia. And uh, about five or six weeks later, they'd been in production for two or three weeks. Um, Joel Silver tracked me down. He actually tracked me down through a friend of mine who I had a big house and everybody shared. My son lived with me. Uh, my good friend lived with me. Two of my good friends lived with me. And uh, the, he rang the house and he said, no, I'm sorry, Vernon isn't here. He was, he was um, working tonight because I was a DJ while I wasn't filming. So I'd been DJing. And he said, oh, what time do you expect him home? He said, uh, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> When he DJs, he never comes home, believe me. Right. Um, he said, oh, is there any way you can contact him? And he goes, you know, what do you do? He said, sure, I'll give it a shot. And I'd always left a black book on this beside the phone, so if anybody desperately needed me, they could just go through it and ring numbers, you know, find someone where I was. So he started the day and worked his way through, and he got somewhere like, I don't know, why? Then this female voice said, who? Vernon. Oh, yeah, the asshole's asleep next to me. Hang on. Hey, you. One of... <laughs> and uh, he gave me the phone and I said, what? And he, he said, um, some guy in America, Joel Sliver or something, um, I had something about Arnold, somebody, uh, needs you to ring him. I went, yeah, tell him to go stuff it. I'm not going to America. <laughs> I hung up the phone. Three more phone calls to the point of where I was even going to kill somebody or I would surrender. So I surrendered. And I went, all right, what am I going to do? And he said, there's a ticket for you at Palomarine. You've got 24 hours to get your life in the gear. So 24 hours later, I was on a plane coming back to America. Right. And uh, when I got here, it was late. Um, and we went out to Warner Brothers and to the not Warner Brothers, to Universal and the Black Tower, which is up on the hill where, where all the big uh, hotel. And they put me up there. And I went to bed and got up, basically. He put, yeah, 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 I'm off the crew. Yeah. So they had to get me on the set really early because they had to do my hair, my beard, all that kind of shit because I looked nothing like I did in the movie. Right. So they took me um, over and uh, shaved off my beard except for the man and, and, and the hair, you know, cut it down and did all the things with it. But then they had a problem. The costume didn't fit me. And they really had no time to make it fit me. So while they were doing my makeup, they were frantically pulling out seams and redoing them to try to get it to at least come up and go around me. Oh, wow. And that's why everything looks so tight. Everybody is saying, well, what, you're trying to show off your privates or something? Because everything's... <laughs> And I said, no, I just didn't have anything to fit me. Um, and so I was in it. And the first scene that I did was with uh, Swartzy. And it was the scene where he's on the table and I come on, and I put the knife to his throat and I say, if I'd had my way, I would have cut your throat. And that's basically in the scene. And uh, so apparently I'm, I'm, I'm half asleep. I seriously was half asleep. And I'm sort of leaning against things, watching what's going on, but going, I'm awake, I'm awake. And Swartzy saw it and he called the director, the producer of uh, Joel and he said, I, this, this isn't going to work. And Joel said, why? You haven't even worked with him. He said, he's a pussy. Look at him. He's all sleeping. We're trying to make a movie. What is this? And so Joel went, hey, what? We'll do this scene, and if you still think he's, mm -hmm. we'll stop production for a couple of days and recast. Deal? So I said, okay. So he's tied, by the way, under this table. I heard everything that was said, just, you know, that was a, <laughs> oh, so I did not know how to whisper. So I heard everything that was said, and of course, being an Australian, I'd go, oh, pussy, am I? <laughs> So it was only a plastic knife, by the way. So yeah, it yeah, said action, and I just went in there and I grabbed this stuff. I had it up under his chin as far up as I could get it. I was holding his head back, pushing it in, and I went, "If I had my way, I would cut your throat." 
and walked off. And then we cut. Joel went, so what did you think? And Swartz went, never give him a real knife. <laughs> and no. Awesome. Famously after that. So, so see, you, you coined it. Yeah. Mm. Never, never speak, never speak bad about an Australian or an Irish or no. English man, no. <laughs> because they'll show you what's what. <laughs> we'll get back. Um, but that was, fun. I mean, I had a lot of fun. Swatchy's like a big kid. So is Mel. They're both yeah, like nice. kids in the toy shop. They just want to look at everything and play with everything. Yeah. Um, which makes it two things. It makes it fascinating. And uh, uh, do we have anybody that's over 12 here? You know? <laughs> um, it's that kind of thing. And I, I mean, it's really bad when I'm on the set and I'm the only adult as well. What the hell? <laughs> Um, but yeah, they're like big kids, but wonderful. I, I have nothing bad to say. What I'm doing now is I'm doing a, uh, I'll be finishing it off um, in November, a, uh, it's called Days of Sodom, a crow film by, or a fan film. And it's a crow movie. It's a movie about the crow. And it was quite funny. I'll, I'll give you a little background. We, we started shooting it quite a while ago because we're relying on fans to, to back it. And um, when we uh, started, um, they were just doing their pre-launch uh, shit way back six months ago, seven months ago for the Crow movie that just came out. And so the uh, producers and Lionsgate got in touch with our producer, writer, who's also the star of the film, um, Cody, and said, what are you doing? And he thought they were going to shut him down. So he went in and he said, it's a blah, blah. And they said, you can't use the word crow at the, uh, at the front of the name. It can be Days of Sodom, a fan-based crow film, if you will accept that, but you can't have crow at the front. So he said, fine. So we did that, and they, they then watched everything we did, which was really funny. When they had the opening of The Crow, he was invited to the opening to walk the red carpet and meet all of the celebrities mm -hmm. uh, because everybody's fascinated with our film. We're doing it for basically, uh, I don't know, a packet of cherry ripe and uh, a hope and a prayer. But what we're doing is brilliant. I mean, it is such an amazing film. And uh, they're so keen on seeing it when we get to the point of having it that they can watch it, they, they want it. And so we're all like, wow, that's a little weird. Um, but it is a really, it's funny because you get tied up into it. I'm, I'm pretty well known for being very, when I'm in there, I'm, I'm kind of spooky and scared. Right. You play a guy who's a little bit, and the other night uh, I was shooting a scene where I killed the crow's wife. And there's a whole, I'm not going to tell you the secrets because it would spoil the no. film. But I, do, <laughs> I do kill his wife. But she's such a wonderful actress. And she and I said to her a couple of times, I said, you know, can I do this because I really don't want to scare you? And she went, Really? Think you would scare me, big boy? And so she had this... <laughs> and we got You're a in, gentle giant, really. Oh, yeah. We, we got into this, and it was, I've got a barbed wire around her throat, and I'm strangling her, and I'm saying stuff to her, and I'm pulling her throat up, and I'm pulling her up, and she's, I taught her very quickly how to get off the ground so she's not hurting herself. And she's got her hands in here, so that most of what I've got is her hands. And I'm doing this whole thing, but it's so intense because I'm right against her face. Her face is there, and I'm right there talking to her into her ear. So you can see her face, and you can see half of mine. Right. And I'm doing really, really intense dialogue. And then right at the end of it, I just hold it, and I come up, and I look around, and I go, boy, nice. And they hand me this big carving knife, and I hold it up, and I show it to her, and I go... Goodbye. Good chest. <laughs> there was anyone would think you're an actor. <laughs> yes. 
you could have, I swear to God, it's the first time in so long that, that you could have dropped a pin and it would have sounded like you'd dropped the Eiffel Tower. Oh, wow. Such silence on that set. Everybody just stood there going, <laughs> waiting for her to do something. <laughs> they were terrified I had actually killed her. No. And she went, wow, that was so cool. <laughs> and then she loved it. Uh, that was great, you know, but it's an intense scene It's because there's so much other things happening through it. Yeah. But it is so epic intense, it's not funny. I can't wait to see that. So when, when are they releasing it? Uh, next year. It won't be finished until the end of November shooting, and right. then they'll do editing. Um, they're doing a lot of editing while they're waiting for things. Right. So they have to build a whole set, because the whole movie's about him tracking me. He wants me dead because I killed his wife. That part of it, I won't tell you what happens. But no, it's a, don't. <laughs> it's amazing, amazing tour, you see. Um, I can't wait the to see you itself, in that. The film itself is just so good. I'm having so much fun in it. And I did another wonderful movie, which is on the circuit at the moment, winning awards continuously, which really intrigues me. It's called um, The Blue-Eyed Boy and Dr. Death and Mr. Death. And what it is, when I got asked to do it, I went, really, you want me? And all it is, is it's one character, and it's not me. I'm a voice on a phone. And I said to the guy, that I knew the director, and I said, I'll do it if I do it in the studio with the actor, so that while I'm doing, while he's on his phone, I'm on this one doing reactions to his, so he understands. Right. And he knows where I'm going. And the director went, oh, I was going to ask him to do that, but I didn't want it because, you know, mm -hmm, you're doing a well, I don't want you to. <laughs> so anyway, I went down and we did it. And it's just this, it's basically it's about a, a guy whose father dies. But he's always, him and his father have always been the same spirit. And now suddenly he's lost. He, he can't, like the... the the washer won't work and he's going mental trying to figure out, you know, dad was here, it'd be three seconds and he's going and, and phone rings. He goes to pick it up and it's his father's phone. Got my pal. And he picks it up and answers it and the boy says, uh, hey, is Ray there? He went, no, Ray's not here. Ray's my father. He died like um, seven months ago. Ah, oh, crap, I missed him. Uh, so you're the son. Yeah, oh, the klutzy one, huh? What's your problem? Um, I can't get the washer to work. Ah, oh, tell me what to do. So I actually become his father on the phone. And I just help him through all these situations all the way through the movie. And the well, end That of, sounds really epic. It's really fun. And right at the end, we lose contact. And then he wants to talk to me because he's, he's you know, he's moving on. I'm moving on. And he, uh, he, he rings my number on his phone and this girl answers, she says, hello? He says, yeah, uh, it's Ron there. She says, what? He says, Ron there, I need to talk to him. She says, who are you, some kind of creep assed nutcase? My father died two and a half years ago. Screw you, slams down the phone. That's the end of the movie. Oh, wow. And you realize I'm a ghost. Oh, that sounds really epic. Are you allowed to talk about that, Vernon? I just did. <laughs> no, is people allowed to know the end before they've seen it? It's a lot more complicated than that, take my word for it. Okay. That's the, the, the incredible... And um, this guy, I swear to God, the director and writer... When's that, is, one, when's that one being released? It's on the circuit at the moment. You can catch it. Uh, so I don't you can know watch you, it right now. I think you can. Yeah. Let's I think find he, out. It's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. But the director writer was hysterical because he comes from another world. I, I'm serious. He's so far out there. And I love him to death. And I've done a couple of films with him. And um, he just writes the most incredible stuff. You know, he, he, I did a film with him. I uh, called Kill Giggles, which is a beautiful film. And it's about a clown. And um, 
Basically, it's about a, a, a guy who hates clowns because his parents got killed because a clown was drunk and rode across the road and the truck coming up had to swerve and his parents were on the footpath and they got hit. So he hates clowns. Right. And well, I don't like them either, to be honest. I think they're very creepy. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Um, but my daughter yeah. was, is, is dating him. And I'm one of the top clowns, was one of the top clowns in the business. So she wants me to come back and see because I live up the country and I'm as happy as a clown and I really don't want to. But I come back to see her and then I start to put two or two together because all these clowns are being killed and that's why she wants me to come back. So there's all these murders occurring and it's right. all clowns. And I'm sort of, after I meet him and I talk to her and I get all down, I go, hmm. So we're having lunch in a restaurant and she goes to the toilet and he's sitting opposite me and he just sits and he looks at me and he goes, for a clown, you're not very funny. And I go, mm -hmm. you know, for a scared little motherfucker, you're not very scary, are you? <laughs> and he just starts there and she walks back and says, well, how are you two getting along? And I go, <laughs> not very well. I've had better days, um, but what happens is I set him up because I know he's a killer mm -hmm. and I get afraid for my daughter. So I set him up and I'm not going to tell you what the end is, you've got to watch it. But it's, it's really, really, really um, interesting and plays out beautifully. And the, the actual ending, oh, I can tell you that part, I guess, because the, the actual ending is, it comes out of the left field and you go, what the f***? Oh, Vernon has an IMDb. And yeah, go to Facebook and Instagram, but he's not on Twitter. X. I don't, I don't think I'm on Twitter. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't matter what I'm don't on. Don't blame right? you. Don't be on it. Yeah, if my wife knows how to use it, I'm on it. <laughs> it's very political. I, I have no idea. I'm like, what? <laughs> but three hundred messages unanswered on Twitter. What's Twitter? <laughs> It's now, called, um, uh, it's now it's been changed to our ex, but a lot of people have been um, uh, sticking with the old name, and Elon Musk doesn't like it. I know. You know, it's 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 really funny that the generation I come from, mm. we didn't have all that. No, no, me. Yeah. We didn't. We actually had to talk to people. You know, we had to real up and talk to them. Yeah. Now, yeah, I. My goddaughter was sitting in a restaurant with her friend and Grace and I having lunch and she's got her phone out and she's going, and I'm watching her, her girlfriend goes, oh, wait, are you two texting each other across the epic table? And she goes, yeah. I went, knock it off, you little shit, you're having lunch. <laughs> it's got to that stage now where we don't talk, we text. It's so it's, it's so it's so weird. People don't go out for coffee and have conversations anymore. No. Nope. I mean, we were when we all met at the New Deal. I mean, I will use my phone to um, to take pictures and stuff. But we sat there talking to each other. Yes. You know, we talk to each other. The phones are down. We're having lunch. We're having a conversation. Yeah, I'm always. Yeah. yeah. It's just, it's, so, and by the way, I'm working with you and all the other brothers and sisters on that whole thing. Yes, and the wolves. Yes, that whole thing. Yes, we're doing that whole thing. involved in their films and things, um, which I will gladly help with. But um, I've still got one, two, three films to make this year and four to do next January, February. So I've still got some films to do. So Grace is right, you have not retired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to stink in her. I'm in her corner because she's kind of, she's on point. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. That's the main thing. I just... You are happy. I just um, enjoy what I do because, and I think, without sticking a feather in my own cap, but I think that over the years that I've done this, I've learnt that the less I do, the better I act. I've been fortunate in being in some very, very, very good movies. You There's have. A couple, 
Japanese movies I did, which are really good. Um, and uh, I think it's Blood and Snow, which I shot up in Canada in the middle of winter in a um, Cold War bomb shelter. This thing goes eight stories down into the permafrost, down. And it is so urban cold, I mean, I swear to God, you would not want to go to the toilet because in no way it's going anywhere. It would just be this very long icicle. It was bitter. But we got to make a really cool movie. That's awesome. Hello, my beautiful darling. Hello. How are you, Grace? Be giving you a hard time. No, it's been a fantastic interview. This is Grace, and she is also on Facebook, and she's a wonderful person. Uh, they complement each other. Yeah, she's a brilliant yoga teacher, one of the best. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but she is. good to see you, Samantha. And you but no, um, everything has been wonderful, and um, I've known you now for so bloody long, I think we're married. But, uh, <laughs> the, I know. Uh, it's um, always a pleasure, my dear. Oh, it's a pleasure with always. you too. I always love hanging out with you, Vernon. You're a great person. And uh, I met you years ago at the Pensacon. Yes, that's what I said. Didn't I? I think we're both married now. Yes, we are. We hang around each other so much. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Lunches and dinners and uh, yeah. We're definitely on the friends. Yeah, like totally. a married couple. He has to do as he's told when I'm there, don't you, Vernon? <laughs> I'm only joking. Uh, but, Grace oh, is wife number one. <laughs> there, uh, yeah, it's one head. That's, that's what her card looks like. BuddhaEd.com. Yeah. Yep. Yoga. Mm -hmm. Grace. Yeah, it's um, Buddha, B U D D H A. And then ED, Buddha Ed. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Vernon Wells, my friend. Oh, and, and thank you to Sam. For being on Chatbox with Sam, season yeah. four. You know. My Australian um, darling. Yes, if I was a younger man, I'd probably come over there and chastise you viciously. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I could anymore. I think it'll be the slowest music in history. <laughs> oh, you are a tyke. Oh. And for the audience, Vernon and I have got the same humour. But anyway, thank yeah. you so much for being on Chatbox with Sam. Smile! <laughs> oh, my. Stay tuned for the sneak peek from next week's episode. Right now, there is one goal which is kind of far-fetched. It would be to it would be to have a role in the sequel for Shang Chi. I remember when the film came out. I don't know what got. I don't know what went went through me, but I, whenever I was like finishing finishing like my day job and I feel like I have some free time, I just decided I would just go watch the first Shang Chi movie. And I ended up watching, going to theaters and watching it almost 16 times. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amazing. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm, so right now, honestly, the goal is very, the goal to be in, like, the, the sequel for Shang-Chi. Not as, not as an extra. Not as an extra or anything. It would basically be, like, I would want to, like, have a speaking, it, it, it's, I would want to have like a speaking part, um, something significant. It's a, it's a very, it's a big pipe. You were in Amityville Cop. Mm-hmm. Yes. How was it on set for Amityville Cop? Amityville Cop was uh, two. Believe it or not, it was a two, three day ish um, gig for me. Um, even though I was. Uh, throughout the screen quite a lot a lo working with um Greg working with uh, Gregory Hatanaka was a bit of like um it's it's very fast he, doing it, it like working with him is a very fast paced uh 
production. Usually he doesn't do usually he doesn't do like too many takes. Like sometimes he'll he'll just gun through like maybe less than two takes and like working on Prey of Wrath actually felt like a, a dream come true because I actually I moved to Los Angeles in 2015. The very next day after I moved in, my first audition was for Syndicate Smasher, which is a prior Benny Tondra project. That was where I met him. So working with Benny and with Doug Totochioka, it was... He, they, working with them is kind of like there is a special place in my heart because they were my first audition when I when I moved to LA. I got the I got that bit part where I got killed by Mel Novak in Syndicate Smasher. So I had like a little death scene and everything. That was that was uh, a very Lovey fun Johnson, special special Lovey Johnson was in that too as well as Prayer's Wrath in, in Syndicate Smasher. Yes, I think I didn't really in I didn't really like interact it with. Uh, she's uh, a, she's a tough cookie to beat, Cynthia is. <laughs> I love the scene where she walks in, she and she says, "Try it with me, <laughs> pick on me," <laughs> to them two guys, and she trashed them. <laughs> and it was lovely in uh, watching the movie because she when she came on set and she's. She did that when she came on screen, and because she was in the set before, but everyone was like, "Woo!" You know. So, and Tatiana did a, played a good role too. But you all were. But I also saw some pictures. I don't know whether you were with Luis and Darren, but they were with Tatiana um, on a boat going across somewhere. This is behind the scenes. Oh, this was no. We actually did film. Um, that right. was something about that was something uh, about Prayer of Wrath that I actually appreciated for is that we actually did reshoots. Right. Um, when we we actually did get on a boat and we actually sailed out um out in Oxnard, mm -hmm. um, and we, I remember one, I one remember one time uh, when out there we were like. It was like very hectic and everything, and I think I also vomited. Oh, bless you. <laughs>